Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you were with us last Sunday, you heard us mention that at Mother's Day, we begin a program here that supports the Pregnancy Resource Centers in both Brattleboro, Vermont, and Keene, New Hampshire. And we do it by filling empty baby bottles with spare change. If, if you're not able to be here to fill a, a bottle, you can go directly to their website and support them financially there as well. So I would encourage you to go to our website, uh, gracefreechurch.org, and then uh, backslash missions, and then you can explore all the missions organizations and missionary individuals uh, that we support and you can find both of those pregnancy resource centers there if you would like to learn more about them and support them and then secondly this coming saturday night at 7 30 one of our organizations that we sponsor here camp spotford which is actually just down the road from here is celebrating 60 years of ministry and part of their celebration weekend is having a concert right here at grace church and we're going to be live streaming that so if you'd like to watch that for free it's this very same address that you have um, on your screen right there and uh, feel free to come and to worship with us and uh, to celebrate with them 60 years of ministry that God has given them. So we would like to invite you to come join us there again. That's going to be next Saturday, the 21st, and that starts at 730, wherever in the world you may be. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. God bless you. And let's go to our worship service. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. Welcome to those that are watching online. We invite you to stay with us as we begin our time of worshiping together by lifting up our voices before the Lord. Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful. said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
Good morning once again and welcome. We are so glad that you are here with us. Today's a special day. As, as you get to know us as a church, you know that missions is part of our DNA. It's kind of our heartbeat, and we have a special opportunity later on today to be commissioning off um, Jeremy and Kayla Windler and their children as they are headed to Paraguay to be missionaries. And that's going to take a little bit later on in our service. But first, our choir is going to come, and they're going to help us in our time of worship as well. Oh 
Thank you very much, choir. Speaking of the choir, if you may be interested in singing with them, they've got one more song to do uh, for this season. That's going to be a month from now, and they've actually convinced Eric and I to come join them for that. And we are putting it out to you. So if you guys would like to join the choir, you can see AD or Varen, and they would love to have you join for that particular Sunday. Um, they do rehearse on Wednesday nights. If that's something you may be interested in, check them out as well. You may not even know why we take time during our services to do announcements, right? It, sometimes people think it's kind of counterintuitive to break things up and to talk about it. But my philosophy is this. We are more than just a Sunday morning church. There are things that take place all throughout the week that you should be aware of, that you could be participating with and worshiping others and, and with. So that's why we take just a few moments to highlight some of these things because we believe them to be important for you to know about and to participate in. So for those of you who were uh, here with us last week, you know we started our baby bottle campaign, something we always do on Mother's Day. And thanks so much for all of you that did grab baby bottles. I think we grabbed over 100 of them last week. There still are a few of them available, so if you didn't have an opportunity to grab one or you already filled it and you want to grab another one, please feel free to do that. The only thing we ask is that you bring them back by Father's Day so that we can get them to the crisis pregnancy centers both in Keene and in Brattleboro so they can use those funds in their ministry. Um, and then lastly, um, next Saturday or this coming Saturday on the 21st, 730 here in the sanctuary, um, Camp Spofford, which is one of the missions that we support is celebrating 60 years of being in ministry and part of the celebration this coming weekend is to have a concert here in the sanctuary and we have been invited to come and to join them so if you would like to come and just worship with them and sit and to enjoy the music 7 30 here um, to, uh, next saturday uh, the 21st and we would love to have you come there as well so as we transition into a time in our service where we all participate together in singing um, it's important to realize, to be honest with each other, that we don't do it in a vacuum. We don't do it um, separated from the events of last week and the events of the week to come. And so often we, we need to take some time to kind of settle ourselves and, and just ask God to remove the distractions of last week or maybe the things that are, are exciting for us in the week to come. And uh, we come with the pains and we come with the anxieties and uh, it's really important for us to remember, and, and we're going to go to Psalms uh, 57 right now because it, it's just it's a great job to remind us that we serve a merciful God. It begins by saying, have mercy on, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful. For you are my soul, which takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. I take refuge till the storm of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I invite you to stay with us once again as we lift up our voices before the Lord, singing of our awesome and amazing God. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all. The whole earth in holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all peace. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the king of glory, the king above all kings. Who rules the nations with 
truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the king. He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
Before Pastor Tom comes and Jeremy comes to share during our commissioning time, we'd like to just have a time of prayer together as a congregation, so I invite you to join us. And Father, you truly have been our hiding place for all generations. From before the mountains came forth, or you made the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we stand in awe of your power of thunder and crashing waves. How you set the stars in place, and we, and we look at that, and we see that the skies are declaring your glory, and we also stand in awe of the fact that the very same God that put all these things into place, the Mighty One, is also very tenderhearted, near to those who are broken, and it's that one who reminds us that those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And Father God, as, as we experience that, as we understand that despite your sovereignty and how big you are, you love us and you know us and you call us by name, God, you call us into confession to you. You desire for us to come to you with our, our desires and our needs and our wants and our hurts and our sin. God, thank you for being a God that hears our prayers and answers them not necessarily the way we may want in our flesh, but the way that you desire that brings you honor and glory and brings us good. God, impress on our hearts a desire to, to give to you the depths of our hearts. Help us to die to the ways that we try to live life on our own, try to control things on our own, and submit to you. Lord, we're thankful also for what you did for us on the cross. Without any of that, we would be lost. God, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice on which we can cling to knowing that through Christ, we are seen by God as righteous and holy. And Father, we do thank you for such great a salvation that we do have. And, and we know that it is by your stripes that we are healed and we find our ultimate healing in you as we come to know you as our Savior. But as we live here on this earth, Father, we also have physical pains. Pains that we know that we can bring to you because we believe that you are the great physician and we believe that your grace is sufficient in our time of need. 
And Father, we do pray specifically for those that are struggling with addiction. For those struggling with mental illness, physical disabilities, Father, I pray that they would find their rest and their peace and their hope and ultimately their healing in you. And Father, for the marriages represented here that are in such a fragile state, Father, I pray that you would renew commitments and love. Father, that you would continue to draw back these couples first and foremost to yourself and to each other. Father, we know that it is in you we find our hope in our healing. Father God, you call us to be united with one another in our faith. Lord, you have brought us to this place where we can worship together. We can know brothers and sisters who share in this love for you. Lord, bring to us a deeper sense of community, both here at Grace Church and beyond these walls. Lord, we ask that you deepen our desire here at the church to be in community with one another. God, help us to utilize opportunities to spend time with each other in small groups or in larger ones, spending time worshiping you, reading your word, studying it, applying it to our lives, praying for one another. And God, may we also serve one another sacrificially, all in a desire to to be your church. And Lord, beyond these walls, there's such a need for your message to go out. God, we just pray that, that you make a call on our hearts as well to seek those in our communities who don't know you. God, be praying for them. Take every opportunity that you present to share with them the good news of your gospel. And Lord, we lift up our missionaries to you that are doing just that, just in other places all around the world. God, we pray for protection. God, draw them to you. Help them to trust in you more. God, and may lives be transformed. And Lord, for our service today, as Pastor Tom and as Jeremy and Kayla Windler come in a few moments to share your word, God, and as we commission the Windlers out onto the mission field, Lord, we just ask that you please be with them. May the sweetness of your word on their lips be like honey to our hearts, God. May it draw us closer to you, and may we come away from this place different than the way we came in, and may it be for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Some of you might not know me. I'm not up here very often, and I'm kind of the new guy on the block. I came here in 1996. So, welcome. This morning, as Paul mentioned, we are commissioning Jeremy and Kayla um, <clears throat> to take the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, this great news that we all have, to the re- least reached peoples of Paraguay. We are the sending church. Now, they are the only, s- the second family that we sent. Um <clears throat> the Bruces we also sent before I came here. 26 years ago, um, <clears throat> and we seek to be the primary supporters of the ones we send. So that's not just financial, that's spiritual, emotional, pastoral. We are seeking to oversee them in an extraordinary way, and we need your help, and we'll give you more ideas on how to do that later. We believe God has called them, um, so, and we are commissioning as verifying the call of God on them. Uh, in a way, we would, we would ordain an elder. Um, <clears throat> as we partner with them, so they're not just going um <clears throat> and then out of sight, out of mind. We are continually with them, reaching the people of, of Paraguay. So this morning, I'm going to give you all a charge. Uh, I'm going to give a start with a call, a uh, charge to Jeremy and Kayla. Um, and then uh, Jeremy will speak. He'll give us his heart. Make some exciting things about the people of Paraguay. And then uh, Sally's going to give you some specific. Sally's the missions chair. Sp- some specific th- things you can do to support Jeremy and Kayla. Jeremy and Kayla, you know better than most, right, how difficult life can be on the mission field. Jeremy and Kayla are missionary kids. They grew up on the mission field. They have watched for firsthand 
what it takes to make disciples of people in another language and in another culture. Some people wrongly think that missionaries are super spiritual people, right? As if something happens, right? You, you fly over an ocean and land in another country and you come out spiritual. They are no different than you and I, weak people who need a power source outside themselves. Jack Miller, one of my mentors, started the mission, and they were sending missionaries overseas, and he realized they weren't doing well. They were burning out left and right. <clears throat> so he started a training course called Sonship. We use it in the training of our leaders here at Grace. And in that Sonship, we learn <clears throat> that missions is like pouring miracle grow on all of your sins. Jeremy Keller. <clears throat> And those of you who have been heavily involved in ministry to other people know the same. <clears throat> it's really hard. And the worst of us comes out, parents. Um, <clears throat> Jeremy and Kayla, do you know what is the most frequent, repeated command in all of Scripture? 117 times. I didn't count them. I took the person I read word for it. Do not fear. Fear not and all the various phrases like that, right? We live in a very tumultuous, difficult world. We need to know that we don't need to be afraid. I'm going to help you to see why not. Some of what I'm giving you today was at a graduation that my son graduated last weekend, and uh, Dr. Chris Miller from Colum uh, Cedarville University spoke to the graduates, so some of this will be familiar to them. Many of you know the story of Moses and how eager he was at standing at the burning bush to lead Israel. Right? Good. You're laughing. He was not. Right? But Moses' time is now up. So now it's Joshua's time. Now, we don't know his attitude from this text, but we can see the people he's trying to lead. We can see why Moses was afraid. Here's the context for God commissioning Joshua. This is in Deuteronomy 31. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. He's going to die. Then this people will rise up and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with, him, with them. That's his job description. Lead this people, Joshua. And this is what the Lord says to Joshua in, the, in verse 23 of chapter 31. And the Lord commissioned Joshua, son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. How'd you like to have a job description like that? And maybe that is somewhat Jeremy and Kayla's job description they haven't met. There are people yet. But three times in chapter 31, we read, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. How easy is that when life hits, when the circumstances of life overwhelm us? I can remember, uh, not a very overwhelming, should have been, circumstance when I dropped one of my sons off at Cedarville University, how overwhelmed I was at what we hadn't done, that we were launching another son, and how that felt. And that was an easy task. I'm turning him over to a Christian university. But here's the antidote, how we can be strong and courageous in any circumstances. It's in verse 3, it's in verse 8, in verse 8. In verse 23, I'll read, I will be with you. What more can we ask for? The God of the universe is with us. Jeremy and Kayla, he will be with you. We can be strong and courageous because he is with us. We see the same in the Great Commission, which Jeremy and Kayla are following in obedience to the Lord 
as they bring the gospel to Paraguay. Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. How's this for a task? Right? Not an easy one, but here is the antidote again. Behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. In other words, everyone who goes and makes disciples of others, we can have this promise that God is with us. What better promise can we ask for? Again, not easy. We easily forget. Life becomes overwhelming. So we challenge you, Jeremy and Kayla, stay close to the Lord. Stay close to each other. Find a support group. And if it means us meeting with you too, like Leslie and I meet with Kevin and Kathy to help support you in that via the internet, may we do that. I love the quote from Lewis Meads, and again, we will be praying for you. And Lewis Meads writes, Courage is only fear soaked in prayer. So this leads me to my charge to you all. We are sending them. So if you're a member here, or you call this home, it's your job too, to be supporting Jeremy and Kayla. In whatever way you can, at least in prayer. Prayer is taking and aiming the power of God at Jeremy and Kayla so they can fellowship with Christ in their journey. This time of year to plant the, the garden. We're going to be planting tomato plants in our garden in a couple weeks. And what does it take for that tomato plant to grow? Now, you might say you need to get the soil good and, and, and all that stuff, but it takes the power of the sunlight to make that grow. And when we pray, it takes the po- aims the power of God onto who we're praying for. In this case, Jeremy and Kayla. You may say, well, God's sovereign. He doesn't really need me to pray, but he asks you to pray, and he uses your prayer. Listen to Philippians 1.19. Paul writes, For I know that through your prayer and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul knows that it is the prayer of the Philippians that what will turn out for his deliverance from jail. Again, how is it that God is sovereign and he uses our prayer? I don't know. It's a mystery. But he does. And he is sovereign. So let us pray. So what do you pray? Turn to, if you will, Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to the content of Paul's prayer. And if we could be praying like this, for our missionaries. I think we will be serving them well. Ephesians 3, 14, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, in other words, he's praying, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, now he gets into what he's praying, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. Right? He's praying that they would have the power of the Holy Spirit. We as Christians have two power sources in our lives, only two. You're either trusting in yourself, which is the enemy, the world, the flesh, the devil, or you're trusting in God. Those are the two power sources. If you're walking by faith, you are walking by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's saying. So notice in verse 17 what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul is praying to believers here. Why is he saying Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? All believers have the Holy Spirit. All the believers have Jesus in their heart. All the believers have the Father in their heart. The Trinity lives within us. 
but it's the Holy Spirit's job to remind us who we are in Christ. Whenever you see this term, the Christ dwelling in us, or in Christ in the New Testament, be thinking identity in Christ. We forget. We as humans think that our identity, our meaning, comes from what we do, or how well that we do at what we do. If you're a carpenter, we take meaning and purpose in building something really well. And some of that's okay, but we go too far. What happens when things go sour, as often is the case with missionaries, right? If they're building their identity on what they're doing, and if they're a typical Muslim going to a Muslim country, which is 15 years before they have their first convert, where's their identity? But Paul is saying your identity is in Christ and what he's done. Right? We get his righteousness. It doesn't matter if we have success or failure. We have identity in Christ. We are forgiven. We are justified. We are children of him. We have the Holy Spirit within us. That's our identity. Whether we have success or we define success, it's very secondary. Jeremy and Kaler, all of us, we know how life is so messy. With not remembering who we are in Christ, we will be defeated. Listen to Paul's words as he continues in verse 17 and following of this identity in Christ and knowing Christ and fellowship with Christ. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what are the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. When we walk grasping the power that we have, grasping the relation that we have with the Almighty God, no obstacle is too big from us remembering what he's done and what he's doing in and through us. One of my mentors, David Paulson, described it well. He, he likened our normal human tem tendency is going to an IMAX theater. And if you've ever been to an IMAX theater, you've got this massive screen, you've got speakers under your seat, and you've got speakers on the wall, and whatever you're watching, it's real life. And that's what it feels like when circumstances overwhelm us. Whatever it is, certainly for our missionaries. But then the Holy Spirit empowers us to remember who we are in Christ. Same IMAX theater, same overwhelming experience, except for the overwhelming is what God is doing in and through us and what God has done and is doing in the world. And we get to participate in that. That's what Paul is talking about here in our text, and that is our prayer and our support of all of our missionaries. So, Jeremy, come on up, share your heart. We're excited to hear what you're saying and what God is going to be doing in and through you. Remember to go off the checklist, turn that thing on. You guys didn't know this, but this is like the Swiss Army knife of pulpits. It has this lever over here. It's almost like a fidget spinner built for Lou or something. But <laughs> it raises up this little thing to hold your papers on. It's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> Good morning. If any of you here still don't know who I am, well, too bad. I'm just kidding. My name's Jeremy Windler, and my wife and kids are down there with y'all, Kayla. Amaris, Ronan, and we seem to have gained another one that's a Nelson. <laughs> First off, what an honor to get to be up here and to be able to share our hearts with you all. It's always such an encouragement to me to see the many faces of those who are running the race that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has called us to. So thank you for that. What an encouragement. Today I'd like to start off by talking about Jeremy and Kayla's not-so-mysterious call to missions. And yes, you did hear that right, our not-so-mysterious call to missions. Well, one of the things you get asked a lot as a full-time missionary is, is, 
how are you called to missions? <laughs> and for some, it's almost like they're expecting you give this crazy story about how there was this, you know, you're sweating one night and you wake up and this big God ray beams down upon you. And a deep voice breaks through the silence and says, Behold, Jeremy, Kayla, go forth to the unreached. And then it all goes silent. And then you have all these fuzzy feelings and comforts and, and all this stuff in your heart. And you're like, I'm ready. <laughs> no, no, that was not the case at all. And I'm not saying that God cannot work in amazing and mysterious ways. But the reality for us is that our calling, if you will, was much less gaudy. And by that I don't mean there was less of God in it, but simply that it was not flashy or showy. And the question must be asked, how did we know we were called to missions? Well, uh, the answer is we saw a different miracle. A miracle, that miracle, was the perfectly preserved words of the creator of the universe written down in our language, this book called the Bible. You're probably going, okay, well, here's the thing. We did something that is going to blow your mind. We read it. <laughs> and in there, we saw truth. And, and I, I know I tend to make light heart and, and jest about it, but it really was that simple. And so I want to share with you some of the verses that we saw that really helped us to understand, too, that we are called to missions. And if, if you want to get out your Bibles, if you've ever done speed drills back in Sunday school, they're about to become handy because I did not ask for these to be put up. So prepare for your Bibles to catch on fire as you're flipping through trying to keep up. 2 Corinthians 5.20, here goes. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now, I look at this verse, and, and if I were to take it literally and in context, I think I might come to the conclusion that God is saying he wants to use us, you and me, to make appeals to the world as if we were his ambassadors. Interesting, right? Almost like he's calling us to a task, or maybe, dare I say, a mission? <laughs> Here's another verse. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Weird, right? Huh. You know, if I, if I didn't know better, I'd say that that verse makes it look like the Christian has been called to proclaim the excellencies of God. And, and I suppose if I were to apply that to our current context, it, it might look like actually going into the world and proclaiming the truths of God and how excellent and amazing he is. That's kind of strange, sounds uncomfortable, sounds like hard work. Maybe we should move on before we get convicted. <laughs> Here's an idea. Let's go back to that verse Tom was using. Let's try that one out. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wait a second. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Hmm. You, you, know, <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm sure there's a way around this. There's got to be a logical explanation. I bet those commands were only for those specific disciples that were around him. So I, and I'm sure verse 20 will clarify that, right? Well, let's try that. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
So teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. So all of us people coming to Christ are supposed to observe all those commands given to those disciples. And I guess that would have to include the command Jesus just gave them about going into all the world and making disciples, wouldn't it? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> you know, I, I think all of us as Christians, we often tend to ignore the Bible and start to look for great signs and wonders and powerful feelings and emotions to guide us and lead us to where God wants us to be. But in doing so, we tend to miss the most obvious and basic truths and guidance that he's placed right in front of us. The Bible. Mine's waterproof. kind of. <laughs> but it's true. We tend to miss it. The truths that are right there in front of us. So as Kayla and I look at scriptures, it has become readily apparent that every single person who professes faith in Christ, meaning every believer, is also called to missions. And if you're willing to honestly look at scriptures, I believe this call is plain as day. Here's the cool thing, though. Once you grasp and accept this truth, I think it really helps to clear things up. Because no longer are you asking and searching what to invest your life and energy into. You know that. Now instead, you can move on to figuring out how can I do this to the best of my ability? How can I most effectively invest my life into what God is calling us as Christians to do? For Kayla and I, I think it was kind of simple. I, I think we took a logical approach. We asked for wisdom that God would guide our steps. Then we asked where are the biggest gaps? What are the biggest needs when it comes to the gospel being taken out? From firsthand experience growing up on the field and investigations, consulting others, we concluded that least reached people groups is where missions is not happening the most. In fact, it's where the gospel is going the least. And from this, we prayed that if God wanted us in overseas missions, that he would open doors. And if not, that he would close doors and make it clear where he did want us. So here we are, stepping out in faith, trusting that the calling in his word is true, not on feelings, not on emotions. We're trusting that what he is saying in his word is true. Taking him at his word. And we're taking him at his word that he will be faithful to guide us and empower us to do missions in Paraguay. Guys, I, I can tell you God has called you to missions. What I can't tell you is how exactly that looks for you personally. To find that out, I'd emphasize this, that you truly put aside time to drink deeply of the word of God. And with an open heart and open mind to the leading of the Holy Spirit, take advantage of the wisdom and counsel of others, perhaps the leadership in the church, who are walking closely with Christ. What are the opportunities available? How can I best get involved? And then go get involved. Having said that, I'd like to offer this thought. And it comes in James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, if you want to turn there. It says this, Therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain and earth bore its fruit. Something that particularly caught my attention in this verse was the part that says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So then the question arises as Christians, whose righteousness do we have? Some of you are catching on. <laughs> that of Christ. So then if we come before God in prayer, and he sees not our own works, our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ, how effective might our prayers be? 
Think about it. May I make a suggestion? Would you consider praying for the missionaries from Grace Church? Would you consider joining the monthly prayer time at Grace? Would you pray more with your loved ones and family? And would you possibly consider supporting us in prayer? See, you may not think God uses your prayers, but I personally have seen and experienced how effectively God does use them. So please, think about that. I'd like to show you something, and for this I'm going to call my volunteers. That includes you. <laughs> Realize it or not. I try to embarrass them as much as I can while they're here. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get you to hold this side. You're going to go over there past the stairs. You can actually go down on the ground area if you want. And you're going to take this. You're going to get down there and walk across there. You are going to stand over here to the left of that. You can hop down on the ground too if you want and then just hold, hold that when it comes by you. Right. And your job is to get it as far over as you can. <laughs> All right, I forgive you. <laughs> it's a nervous thing coming in front of people. Seriously. Be courageous. Here we go. Look at these names. Look at this paper. Look what's on it. I'm about to tell you. On here is a continent listed here. In that continent is a country. In that country is a people group. And down here is the number of people in that people group. For instance, Asia, India, people group, leash, 2,340. What that means is for each of those people groups, there is no full translation of the Bible in their language. There's about 45 people groups to a page and about 44 pages on here that have not a full translation of the Bible in their language. And this does not include least reached groups who might have a translation, but no one's taking it to them. There's well over a thousand people groups on here. Question might arise, when will these people get to sing Amazing Grace like we do? You guys can stay there for a moment. Read Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed. And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And then how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. All right, Kesey, if you want to come drop that in past the stairs here so no one trips on it and you guys can just lay that on the floor and it can stay there. Yeah, just bring it right over here, Casey. How many of you knew that there was so much need around the world? We as Americans have been blessed. Do you know we have multiple hundreds of translations of God's word in our own language? And there's thousands that don't even have a full translation. Question might arise then. Why are there so many people like these that no one's reaching? Well, my opinion is twofold. Number one, we're ignorant as Christians, and we have done a terrible job of looking outside our little bubble, and seeing the greater picture when it comes to the needs around the world and what God's doing in missions. Number two is, we as Christians are more like the general Israelite than we are like Joshua and Caleb. When we start looking at the task of reaching overseas, we can't help but seeing all these giants, so to speak, and then like the spies sent to Canaan, we conclude we could never do that. There are big spiders over there. <laughs> the language is hard. Help you get a grasp of what I'm saying, I want to walk you through just a couple things that Kayla and I are going to be facing when we get to Paraguay. And so assuming everything goes as plans, or at least the general plan, we'll be flying out of the U.S. and then landing in the capital of Paraguay, where we will then have to travel to a border town that borders Brazil. Once we get to this border town, we can then be working more on documentation, of which we're still working on our U.S. side, but we get to work on more once we get there. 
And if you know documentation, it tends to always be complicated. On top of that, we will also be looking for a place to more permanently stay, at least for the couple years that we're doing our initial language study for national language. Um, so there's that, finding a house that's more permanent that we can live in while we do that. It tends to take a couple years to learn a language. So the question is, why learn language? Well, how are you supposed to disciple people and plant a church if you can't even speak their language, right? So I'd say that language and culture, we'll get to that, are probably two of the greatest practical learning hurdles that missionaries tend to face overseas, getting to a fluency in a language. It's also very mentally demanding, and these are what I'd call some of the giants when you get over there. For example, did you know English does not even come close to making all the sounds that the mouth can make? And if you try to learn another language, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to have to learn to hear. That sounds strange. You're going to have to learn to hear sounds that you're not normally able to pick up in speech and reproduce them. Here we go. Let's look at some sounds. This is the fun part. Well, listen, listen to the difference. Papa, 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 papa. What's the difference? Anyone know? <laughs> one is more Spanishized, one is Englishized. In English, we aspirate. It means there's a, there's a puff of air that comes out when we say a lot of things. This is the reason, like, you might hear someone from Mexico with an accent come in, and, and you say, hey, hey, there's a can of Coke, and he goes, can, 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 instead of can, 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 because there's, there's an extra puff of aspiration that Spanish does not tend to use. And it's very hard to hear that. So you need to know that there's these differences because if you don't, some languages have both aspirated and non-aspirated of the same sound. And so if you do not say one or do say one, it may make a completely different word. Completely different by one little sound. Here's some more sounds you might hear in Paraguay. Ah, 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 ah. Hear the difference? How about this? Oh, 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 oh. Or eh, 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 eh. What's the difference? Well, yeah, yeah, one's from the south. It's a southern, no. <laughs> one is nasal, one is not, meaning you say the letter either through your mouth, ah, or you say the letter through your nose, ah. Uh. And that makes a huge difference as to what you're saying. You need to be able to hear this and reproduce it in a rapid speech context. It is not easy, believe me. There are muscles that you haven't even developed in your mouth to be able to make those that you have to learn to use and exercise them. What about grammar? We all love grammar. Only I, I don't. <laughs> and if you're gluten-free, now is the time to run because Guarani is what you call an agglutinative language. <laughs> Some of you got it. <laughs> so what that means is rather than adding additional words to a sentence to show grammatical distinction, Multiple prefixes and suffixes may be added instead. Not always, but in many cases. So to take a word, and I'm not very good in Guarani, I have a lot to learn. You might say hesha. In Guarani, that means to see. And then you might say there's this prefix ja, and I'm going to put that on hesha, and we have jahesha. It's one word, jahesha. We see. Okay. And now we could add another prefix on there, only that prefix, for whatever reason, goes in between that prefix and the word. And so now you have this prefix jo, which is a reciprocity prefix, meaning it's like each other. So we each other see. And then we might go, I want the word to be longer, so you add another suffix on there. So that goes on the end of the word. Prefixes are first, suffixes are last. So you put this suffix beve, which means until, on there. So now you have jajo hesha one word, jajo hesha And it basically means we each other see until. Now your brain's going, we each other see until. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> now you're thinking, you're trying to unscramble this grammar in your head, and we each other see until we, uh, we see. And, uh, okay, so that means until we see each other. Okay, got it. What is that? Oh, see you later. Oh. <laughs> grammar, people, it is huh, your biggest friend. <laughs> It's important. You need to know these things if you're going to communicate in another language. And it is hard. This is mentally demanding. It, it makes your brain hurt. This is, this is one of the simplest things I could come up with. It gets way more complicated than that. 
culture. Here's another thing. I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> learning culture is basically like learning another language. So you have language learning and you have culture learning, which is like another language. And it plays an equally important role in communication, only it tends to revolve around the things that aren't said and the unspoken laws of how to do things or when to do things or what to do, how it's appropriate or not. So for instance, if I am in America and someone says, hey, 2 o'clock, I'm having a birthday party, you are invited. When do I come? 2 o'clock. Be there or be square. So that's when I come. That's the polite and appropriate thing to do. In Latin America, you might see this a lot in Latin context, you will get asked the same question. Hey, having a birthday party. It's at 2 o'clock. You're invited. What do I do? Do I go at 2 o'clock? If I did, it would be very weird. <laughs> You're standing there and nothing, and everyone's awkward, and it's like, why are you here? Because the expectation culturally is that you show up 30 minutes to an hour late. It's just an understood thing. No one told you this. You just, it's culture. It's how we do things. We would never do that in America generally. <laughs> what about this? Uh, imagine for a moment that some guy is walking outside your house on the sidewalk, sees your house, turns to it, and starts applauding it. No. <laughs> Come on, what is going on? This guy is mental. Call the police, quick. <laughs> if you did this in Paraguay, you missed out on what was going on. You just burned a bridge because all that was happening is this guy was ringing your doorbell. He was saying, look, I'm here to visit. That's his way of telling you, I'm here. I want to visit you. Hey, friend, <laughs> if you don't understand culture, it's going to get you in hot water. You have to understand it to be able to communicate and build relationships properly. So that's just a small sample of the complexities that we face.
and maybe you were a part of sending her parents out on the mission field. Or many of you have had your children in youth group with Jeremy and Kayla. I know I have benefited from that. So would you consider how you can be a part of this team? As they're sending church, we want to care for them, and we want it to be consistent and helpful. Because the missions committee members serve terms of three to six years, perhaps by the time they come back on furlough, none of those same people will be on the missions committee. So it's important to have consistent care. That's why we're trying to set up the support team. If you're interested in that, you can contact Jeremy and Kayla, or myself, or Tom Burns. Currently, the Windlers do not have all of their needed financial support, so would you prayerfully consider partnering, partnering with them financially? The QR code on the back of this card will bring you to the website for Partners for Paraguay, who is their sending organization, and you can make a one-time or an ongoing donation there. You can also find out more information about Partners for Paraguay on that website. So today, Jeremy and Kayla, you want to come up here? Today, we wanted to commemorate this day with a gift, so we, brought, we bought the Windlers a Bible. It's not waterproof. <laughs> um, and I would like to ask the elders and uh, mission committee members to come on up. We're going to pray for the Windlers. And while they come, I wanted to invite all of you to stay after the service. We have a cake to um, celebrate this occasion of us sending them. And if you're gluten-free and Jeremy's grammar lesson hasn't caused you to run away, there's gluten-free cupcakes, too. You guys can um, pray if you're led, Lord. Thank you again. What a blessing to have watched <clears throat> you grow. Jeremy Kayla, um, Kayla through her life. And then both of them, the last couple of years here at Grace. Lord, to see the fruit that you're bearing through the youth, in the youth, and now in their lives and in their family. Thank you. Lord, would you bless them <clears throat> so they can be a blessing to many. Lord, raise up a team here at Grace to come around them, grow that team, and to support them well. Thank you. Lord God, just just thank you so much for Jeremy and, and Kayla, Kayla's uh, just courage to uh, step forth and do something new and different um, in their in their life and and with their family Lord and just pray your protection on their family as they go through uh, difficult times and new things Lord bless them um, give them um, just just trust in you to provide for everything Lord and uh, that we would uh, seek out how we can be your hands and feet as we uh, uh, serve and minister to them um, across the world Lord Lord God, we pray that the enemy not take a foothold. Mm. Lord, that they trust you. Lord, that they draw closer to you, God. But we ask that you please protect them as they go. God, so that the devil and his evil schemes are not able to thwart the work that you have them to do, Lord God, but instead your kingdom be advanced through the work that they bring. Father, we ask that you would bless this couple that when they go through the trials that will come, Lord, that they'll remember you, that they'll draw close to you. We pray that you would help us as a congregation to support them prayerfully and financially, financially, Lord, that you would open the doors in the country where they're going, Lord, that you would have their paperwork go through smoothly, you would provide financial support that's needed, Lord, that you would just confirm while they're there, Lord, that you're their strength, you have their best interest in heart, Lord, and that they would they would reach the people of Paraguay in a mighty way for you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, we have a friend, oh, such a friend, 
And we can find our hope and our promise. And in Jesus, the yes and the amen of every promise of scripture is fulfilled. And we can trust him for that. So I invite you to stand with us as we sing this wonderful hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more, oh, for grace to trust him more. And now unto Jesus, that friend, that trustworthy one, be all glory and majesty and power and dominion both for now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace.